恭敬应大德圣亲，为此发挥尽一切众生。勤转妙法文，教导我们如何了生，脱死离苦的乐，修真无生。Will the Sangha, with great virtue, out of compassion, for the sake of this assembly and all living beings, please turn the wonderful Dharma wheel to teach us how to leave suffering and attempt bliss and end birth and death and quickly realize non-birth. Namu tasa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa Namu tasa bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambu Dasa. Homage to the blessed, noble, and perfectly enlightened one. Homage to the blessed, noble, and perfectly enlightened one. Namo Sadanto Suche Doye Olahudi Samyao Sanputoshi. Namo Sadanto Suche Doye. Supreme and wondrous Dharma, subtle and profound, rarely is encountered, even in a million eons. But now we see and hear it and accept it reverently. May we truly understand the Buddha's actual meaning. Good evening, everyone. Venerable Master, Dhamma friends, welcome to our Sutra lecture tonight. We're here in the Berkeley Buddhist Monastery and gathering of our larger Dharma family. And we are going to be looking into the Avatamsaka Sutra, the Flower Garland Sutra, the ninth stage of the ten stages. And boy, it took a long time to get here, but I'm happy to have opened this text up with all of you. It is the 13th of October. We're still in Libra and uh, heading towards Scorpio, which will happen all too soon. And... Uh, Let's begin tonight with the opening verses on the cover. It's a title, actually, here on the cover of the sutra. And we do it with a melody and invite you all to join in. Mm, it's chilly tonight. It's a bit chilly. It's getting, we're into autumn. And on the side of the Buddha Hall, we have some blankets. I think there's actually people put them out on the cushions. And if you would like to cover up your legs or wrap up a little bit, please do, because we, um, we will be turning on the heat. We're just right at that in-between place where uh, it was not quite cold enough to turn the heat on, but it's uh, got a little nip in it. So we don't want people to be uncomfortable because of the temperature. So for the time being... If you don't have a blanket or if you don't have enough blankets, take one from the seat next to you. And then when the person comes and sits down, you can struggle with them. You can actually practice generosity by magically handing them a blanket and making a new friend, right? So here we go. This is a...
That's our melody for Namo Dafang Guangfo Huayan Jing, which is found right here on the cover of our text. What we're saying is homage to the Buddha's Flower Garland Sutra of Great Expanded Teachings, Huayan Hai Hui Fo Pusa, and the Ocean Wide Flower Garland Assembly of Buddhas and Bodhisattvas. That's our, what we're chanting as we do this. So I'd like to invite everybody to join me, please. Here we go. Namo da fang guang fu wa yin ji wa yin hai wei po pu sa na mo da fang guang wa yin ji wa yin hai wei po pu sa Namo da fang fang po wa yen ji wa yen hai wei o pu sa namo da fang guang po wa yen ji wa yen hai wei o pu sa One more time. Namo da fang po wa yen ji wa yen hai hui po pu sa. Or as they would do in China, po pu sa. Ending it in that minor fifth. Beautiful. That's the, uh, uh, they do that with uh, all kinds of tunes, including the Jie Zai and uh, the uh, Lin Zai Yi, pretty much always, instead of, we, we Americans, we're pretty simple, straightforward, da da di da da da, you know, and it's like, kind of over, da da di da di di di, a little bit of mystery at the end, da di, very nice. Okay, we've talked about the date, we've talked about the weather, we've talked about blankets, we've invited the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas to draw near. We're almost ready to launch right into our text. I wanted, before we start, to acknowledge that although there are numerous friends here and welcome, who are people who are here for maybe the first time, or those who have, don't get to come back as often as they might want to, but made it out tonight, welcome. And at the same time, we are webcasting out into the ether sphere, into the intertubes, and we've got friends on GoToMeeting who are joining. We have friends on YouTube listening live, and those folks will be also able to watch it again on the archive. And we have, courtesy of some friends in Australia, translating for China over yy.com and I'm told everybody everybody in Australia who's listening in I'm told that yy.com is not the one to use anymore it's called Weiho Weiho it's a much better cleaner kind of uh, network in, in China yy.com is really za any kind of Blanche Bazal, you know, all kinds of stuff. So uh, that's someone's opinion. I don't know myself. I haven't. I've peeked at it, but I never tried to use it. So we might investigate Weiho uh, as an option for networking, as they say, inside China. So, okay, but in any case, lots of hands, lots of 
eyes, lots of consciousnesses working together to get this lecture out to people. And for that, we are grateful and appreciative. Um, okay, we've got a lot to do tonight. And if you would turn in your text of term, page 54 and 55. Okay, and I didn't mention our Vietnamese translation happening simultaneously up in the balcony. So we have two languages here in the building. Okay, we have looked at all of the stanzas, one, two, three, four, five, on this page. And actually, we, uh, we would be, if we were going to only progress and never come back, we would start with the last one on, probably the first one on page 56 and 7. But... As I looked at the flow of this story, the narrative here, we've, uh, I want to pick up the whole, the whole last uh, sequence from start to finish. So you can get a sense of where the sutra is moving us. And some of the things to say about it is, this is a particularly uh, story-like section of the text. This is narrative. It's, there's people doing things here. So that's a story. Right? And what's, where we are, we're mm, back at the, the break between chapters. And there's a place. So I want you to use your, open up your imagination that place where images are made in your mind, and visualize the Buddha. In this case, it's not the Buddha. The Buddha is sitting there silent, but the Buddha is sending out his uh, Wei Shen Zhili, they call it, his quite majestic, marvelous strength, which you could imagine kind of as a wave, or a light, or a broadcast, or a vibe, or a whammy, they give him the whammy. Remember the whammy growing up? Put, put the whammy on him. I'm going to cast a spell on you. Screaming Jay Hawkins, remember that? The whammy. And uh, this is the kind of thing the Buddha's doing, but he's not talking. The person who is being whamified, who is catching a spell, is a, a monk whose name is uh, Qinggang Zhang, Vajra Treasury, storehouse of Vajra. And this Bodhisattva is finished with the explanation of number eight. We just did that. He's now starting number nine. And number nine, you can think about it as instructions. It's a set of instructions. It's information. It's a how-to. You know, do it this. Just go from step A to step B to step C, like that. And he has to be invited. He doesn't speak without invitation. And there's another... Bodhisattva, maybe a monk, maybe not a monk. We don't know how he looks, actually. Your imagination probably will come up with a vision of him, and probably everybody's got one slightly different. He is there as the interlocutor. That's an a, uh, English lit word for the questioner. He's the one who says, hey, please, people here want to know. We're interested in learning Everything the Bodhisattva knows on the ninth stage, so please do it. He's the one who's officially Ching Fa, right? And he kind of stands in between the assembly. Okay, imagination time. What does the assembly look like? Well, it's a lot, a lot, a lot of living beings and sages both. People who are no longer living beings, they're now beyond birth and death, right? They're beyond mortality, but they're not only immortals either because why they can come and go as they choose so there are bodhisattvas there there are dragons there for sure protecting there are devas there there are all kinds of spiritual entities tian long ba bu the eightfold pantheon are all there uh Chen ta po ya ye cha lo cha chen ta po er shu lo jia lu lo 
摩诃罗切人、非人等。Okay, that's the gang. That's the eight. There's yakshas. There's Gandharvas. There's Kinaras. There's Garudas. There may be Rakshasas. These ghosts that specialize in eating blood and flesh of living beings. <laughs> Scary creatures that otherwise would be running amok and causing havoc, and everybody would be heading for the exits, you know, hoping that they weren't locked in. But because of the Buddha's virtue, these very scary beings are guai guai. They're just they wag their tails, they crouch down. The dragons curl up, the tigers crouch, you know, and they're all wanting to hear the Buddha speak the Dharma. There are probably a couple big shoes there, big shoonies, and and、uh, if we t- or if we see the pictures, we we used to have right over there behind where Jin Fu is sitting. On that wall, there used to be a Pure Land picture. I, I don't know where that went. When we moved the Pure Land picture, there was a Pure Land painting of the assemblies in the Pure Land. It it got moved somewhere. It's it's around somewhere. Maybe no, it's not the dining hall. It's is it that no? Was that it? No, I think it's another one. Anyway, well, there's there, we have a lot of them, and it's some artist's version, his or her imagination of what the Pure Land looks like. And oh my goodness, you just see down in the back, there are human kings. You know, there are just some maharaj, maharaj, who have come from there, and they're they have their their entourage, and there's all kinds of beings. Okay, so that's where we are. We're right in that place, and the sutra takes us there to see what goes on when. Moon of Liberation, Chia Toye Pusa, comes to ask Jin Gang Zang Pusa, Vajra Treasury Bodhisattva, to speak about to teach the ninth stage, the ninth level, the Bodhisattva's instructions. Okay, so that's that's it. That's where we are physically. Now there's action taking place in the sutra, and this is this is a neat part because it's pretty much you know point to point to point. You can follow it. It's not. Full of, you know, you have to have deep samadhi to understand that kind of dharma. It's not that comes later, right? So what we have now is the devas, the gods, have come down to do their spectacular aerial ballet. Anybody watch the Blue Angels last weekend? Okay, somebody did. Oh, Homerito's hand went up. He saw the Blue Angels. Was it cool? Make a lot of noise. Really loud, huh? Yeah, and boy, I mean, those those are airplanes going super fast and super close to each other and barreling through the sky. Well, the devas, the devas make the blue angels look, you know, kind of mechanical. And blue angels are wonderful, I suppose. But the, the when the devas fly in formation, it's like, you know, they appear and they're gone. They appear and they're gone. The blue angels can't vanish. You know. They, They have to actually travel, but devas pop up and vanish and pop up again, and they're always throwing wonderful offerings in the air, and and we have a couple of them. Or it's night, so we can't see. We're radiating out. When the sunlight's coming in, you can see our devas. So anyway, that's going on, and the sutra takes us right into yeah, kind of like what we're seeing in Amitabha, right, the Pure Land up here, right. Takes the sutra takes us right into、um, the songs of praise given by the devis, the female, the goddesses. The goddesses are offering their praises of the Buddha. How wonderful the Buddha is! And that's our text tonight. So we, as they say, all on the same page. Yes, Dharma Master, and it's page fifty-four. Bingo! We are on the same page. So the first stanza is at that time, right? It says this is what's coming. Then notice stanza two has quote marks. That's the song. We get to see the whole song that the devas, the devis, are singing. So, I mean, if this were a movie, this would be the scene where who would we get to play the goddess? Lady Gaga, right? <laughs> Lady Gaga would be the goddess, and she'd have some sort of wings strapped on, you know. She'd turn it very cool. 
she's she's great and or maybe it might even be somebody like who would it be maybe it'd be computer graphics you know yeah uh, um singing the song we get to watch it okay we all excited about getting to hear the davis sing so i thought it'd be fun to do the whole song since it's we'll finish the song over the next page so um let's do it this way um you all want to practice some chinese we haven't done some chinese in a while all you students of mandarin and future students of mandarin the nice thing about our text is um it gives you the a b c d plus the tone mark so let's look at that top line under page 54 at the very top there it says sure sure right sure fourth tone all you polish big shoes who are studying chinese you can sure sure right zhong ye tong shi zou first tone okay like that so that's what we're going to be doing we're going to be reading the chinese along there okay and so it doesn't get too boring we'll read the chinese together i'll give you a line you give it back then we're going to go over to the english and do it in unison and we'll go all the way over to the three stanzas on 57. We haven't read a big chunk for a while. Okay, are we ready? Here we go. I'll give you the line. Shi shi zhong ye tong shi zou. Shi shi zhong ye tong shi zou. Bai qian wan yi wu liang bie. Bai qian wan yi wu liang bie. Shi yi shan shi wei shen li. Yen chu miao yin er zan tan. Terrific. Okay, over to the right, page 55. We ready? With me? Here we go. At that time, the many varieties of music played in harmony, hundreds of thousands of millions of endlessly many kinds, all through the well gone ones. awesome spiritual might expressed these wondrous sounds of praise and acclaim great okay let's let me just toss in a make sure we get the words and then we'll go on so the narrator says what happened next was musical cacophony it's like every spotify channel in existence played at the same moment Right? Or if you turned the dial right through all the different channels on the radio. Remember radios? We used to have them. And all the music, oh gosh, hip hop follows right on top of country, follows right on top of praise, follows right on top of heavy metal, falls right on top of opera, you know. And yet it's wonderful. It's not horrific. It doesn't blast your ear. It delights you. Endlessly many kinds of music all through well gone one who dat that be the buddha right well gone one you've heard of the thus come one this is the well gone one shan shi shi jin jie when you do the 88 buddhas every other night if you come to evening chanting shan shi shi jin jie wu shang shi qiao yu jiang fu tian ren shi fu shi zun shan shi is the well gone one that's one of the buddha's 10 titles because of his whammy that he gives his invisible investment of energy these sounds of praise of the buddha come forth okay so far so good good pursuing further here we go notice the quote marks this is the we're into the song we're now singing with the goddesses here we go ji jing tiao ro wu go hai your turn ji jing tiao ro wu go hai Sui so ru di shan xiu xi. Sui so ru di shan xiu xi. Xin ru xu kong yi shi fang. Xin ru xu kong yi shi fang. Guang shuo fu dao wu qun sheng. Guang shuo fu dao wu qun sheng. Excellent. Good stuff. Ready? to the right the calm here we go the calm and gentle free from defilement and harm 
cultivates this practice skillfully wherever he goes. His mind, like empty space, reaches all places in ten directions, extensively explaining the Buddha's way and awakening all beings. Okay, yeah, yeah. The first praise. This is praise. This is Cheng Zan Rulai, right? Christianity is a praise tradition. Buddhism is a praise tradition as well. The Pure Land, the, the Bhakti Yoga phase, right? Bhakti, they call it, which is just pouring your heart out. He's calm, he's gentle, he's free from defilement, he never harms. Cultivates this practice skillfully wherever he goes. What practice? We're going to find out. His mind, like empty space, reaches all places in ten directions. How about that? That's a whopper. We tried to talk about that last time we read this, and it was like, whew. extensively explaining the Buddha's way and awakening all beings. Okay, why that? This stage, this ground, the Dijo Di, is about speaking Dharma. It's about teaching. This is the teaching ground. And how the Bodhisattva here can do that. All right? So far, so good. Extensively explaining the Buddha's way and waking us up. Next one, number three. Ready? Tian. Tian Shang Ren Jian Yi Che Chu. Your turn. Tian Shang Ren Jian Yi Che Chu. Xi Xian Wu Deng Miao Zhuang Yan. Wu Deng Miao Zhuang Yan. Yi Cong Ru Lai Gong De Shang. Gong De Shang. Ling Qi Jian Zhe. Le Fo Zhi. You said, but it says Yao. Why do you say Le? Maybe it should be Yao. You must say, Shi Yao Fo Zhi ma? Hai Shi Le Fo Zhi? Yao. Yao Cai Dei. Uh, okay, Yao. So it's correct. Ready? Over to the right. Number three now. Everywhere. Here we go. Everywhere in the heavens and among humans as well, he makes adornments appear incomparably fine all born from the Tathagata's merit and virtue and inspiring delight for the Buddha's wisdom in those who see them. Okay. The topic of this one. Now we're going to come back and go deeper, but I just want to make sure we get this, the flow so we can understand it. Everywhere in the heavens. So the Buddha goes into the heavens and among humans, the Buddha comes down to the earth. He makes adornments appear. The Buddha makes things fabulous, incomparably fine, and they come from his gongda, his merit and his virtue, his own accomplishments in the spiritual path, and inspiring delight for the Buddha's wisdom in those who see them. You could say that everything that the Buddha tried to do, um, particularly in this chapter, but from the start, was to get people to be delighted in wisdom. That's what it says. So what? If you're delighted in wisdom, you'll go for it. You'll cultivate. Once he explains how to get it. Because his job is to show us that it's inside us. The Buddha's wisdom is not something you get online. Amazon.com does not carry Buddha's wisdom. Or if it did, we couldn't afford it. You know, uh, You can't get it anywhere. You can't download it. Right? You can't have it delivered. It's inside already, but if we don't know about it, how can we delight in it? If we don't understand how to get it, we might delight in it, but think somebody else had it. Well, I'm just a girl. I can't have it. Wrong. X. You know. Oh, I'm kind of dumb. I didn't really go to college. X. I'm only going to junior college. I'm not qualified. X. <laughs> Red X over that one. So, right? It's like the Buddha says, yeah, wisdom is there inside you. You should delight in it because it's freedom. Get that wisdom, you are free. Free from what? Fear, anxiety, depression. Free from self-doubt. Free from misery. Stuff goes bad, it doesn't touch you. Because why? You have wisdom. You see through. You understand the, the root 
and the branch tip. You see the branch tip of the leaf, you know the root. You see the root, you can understand every single branch and leaf. That's wisdom, right? From seed to fruit to the seeds in the fruit that make the new fruit. Cycles, you see it all. So, that's his job, is to make us go, whoa, yeah, I want that. And then he says, oh, you do? Oh, well, here, hold these precepts. Here, enter the samadhi state. Ah, there you go. That's your own wisdom. It's yours and nobody can take it from you because nobody gave it to you. Can't take it away. It's yours inherently. So, you get it. Okay, next, that's, there's a praise. That's a nifty verse, right? That's the song. Like the, this is the Deva's song about the Buddha. Okay, number three. That's uh, number four, but the third song verse without, it's Buli uh, Yi Cha, right? Here we go, ready? Buli Yi Cha Yi Zhong Tu. Yi Cha Yi Zhong Tu. Ru Yue Pu Xian Zhao Shi Jian. Yin Sheng Xin Nian Xi Jie Mie. Pi Yo Gu Xiang. There you go. P, let me try it again. I screwed up. Let me try it. Here we go. P Yu P Yo Gu Xiang Wu Bu Ying. There. Ah, we did it. Okay, are ready without leaving? Here we go. Without leaving this one place, he travels to many lands as the moon shines everywhere, illuminating the world. For him, voices and the mind's thoughts all fall still, just as an echo sounds everywhere through a valley equally without fail. Okay. So, this, the topic of this verse is another quality of the Buddha, which is truly, this is what you call bukasui. Why? You really can't think of it. It's not an image that you can hold in your head and get it all and Oh yeah, oh, I see that. It's, it goes beyond gravity, goes beyond physics, goes beyond light, goes beyond measuring, right? The Buddha doesn't leave right where he's sitting, but he travels everywhere. And you go, er, contradiction, right? That's illogical. That doesn't, quote, make sense, does it? Correct. Inconceivable. Because the... This is one of those mysteries that happen. There's, there's a wonderful uh, list that I really like called the Shi Xuan Man, the Tenfold Gates of Mystery. Shi Xuan Man. And it's, um, it comes from the Avatamsaka. This is something that Ben in Australia would like. And... Uh, and also Cliff and Sam. When I get there, I'll, I'll introduce the Shi Shen Man. What is it? It's out and out miracles that are embedded in the, the Avatamsaka. When I say embedded in the Avatamsaka, what I mean is if you work with these particular methods, your mind can open up in these ways so that, for example, one of the Shi Shen Man is that the incomparably vast and the immeasurably tiny exist in the same place. Something that is so big you can't measure it can fit entirely within the tiniest particle, no obstruction. So vast and great can enter into the tiniest. That's one of the Sri Shenman. Okay, here's another one. The Buddha can be in one place and without moving can appear everywhere. So, okay. You go, mm, all right, suspend judgment. I won't have to say right or wrong, yes or no. There's more to learn. Okay. And then it gives you a natural image, like the moon. Right? We talked about teacups. Everybody, uh, take the lid off your teacup and hold it up. All right? I'm not seeing any teacups out there. Here we go. Hold your teacup up and watch. And if the moon's up there, it's like, oh, I got the moon. You got the moon? Oh, you do. You can't have the. We all got the moon. Oh, we all got the moon. You know, somebody's out there with a pot. You know, like, yeah, yeah, I got the moon. Yeah, yeah. 
somebody else with a baby swimming pool. Oh, look how big my moon is, you know. And the moon appears equally. Somebody else has got a teacup, you know. Right? Oh, there it is, cute. Hey, cool. Hey. There's the moon in your teacup. And the moon is only one. But however many bodies of water, that's how many moons there are. So you go, oh yeah. Which one is the real moon? Which one is the real Buddha? Same, right? So, huh, maybe it's not so like contradictory as it seems. Interesting. So, now, here's a key to it. He says, for the Buddha, at this point in the Buddha's cultivation, voices and thoughts in the mind all fall still. And at that level of stillness in the mind, something wonderful happens. It's not random. This is a step in the path of the Buddha's cultivation. It's kind of samadhi and its responses. So, samadhi is this amazing state that everybody, anybody can approach. But when it's working, it's thoughts are still. Your thoughts aren't moving. To give that an image, to give it some body, um, you know, you've heard of the four dhyanas. We've talked about them before. They say this kind of meditation. And when you, you're in the dhyanas, you're pretty quiet. Your life is, is still. That's not to say st still. Your, your life is kind of bland. And that's the funny part. Because, like I said, you used to go like this. You know, your life was like this constant circus of highs followed by deep lows and then seeking another new high and then a deep low. Where? Tongue. New restaurant. Got to go try it. You know, wow, a little something a little different. Oh, a little different. You know, that's yeah, a little different. You like it, you know. And, and then it's like, oh, after you've surprised and, you know, excited your tongue, you open your own refrigerator, nothing looks good. And it's just all cornflakes, you know, it's just all cornflakes. Because why, you've been, you know, and your tongue just goes on strike. So, okay, so instead of that kind of experience, if you're cultivating the dhyanas, Test for you. You want to test it out? When was the last time you tasted water from the tap? We don't do that, Dharma Master. <laughs> Not where I live. Oh. So I had a practice at one point of everywhere I went, and I go to a lot of places, I would go over and taste the tap water and sit with it and drink it for a while, just a couple of days, a couple, three, four days, to get used to the local water. Now, granted, water out of the tap, ours comes from Hetch Hetchy Reservoir, not bad. East, East Bay Mud, they call it. East Bay Municipal Utilities District, EB Mud. They deliver pretty good water. They work on it. And if you're a purist, you can taste the stuff, you know, and the, the chlorine and whatever they put in there. But we have a water filter over our sink. It's that little one to the left there. And um, that filters out any stuff, but the flavor is still the same. If you go around and you drink local water, for the first couple of days, your tongue goes nuts. No flavor. I want coffee. Mm. I want tea. I want poor. I want gaoshan cha. You know, your tongue is in there. I want Mountain Dew. You know. So, but then, after a while, it's like, oh, water. Wow, that actually has remarkable flavor. Then you go to Rome. Anybody do it? You go to Rome, and right there in the street, there's a fountain. There's not a fountain, a spigot. And it's actually, usually it's a thing. and It's in the rock. And you watch people, and they're going right up there and going, where oh, they got their cup, and you go, well, oh, you can't do that in Rome, right? And he goes, no, perfectly fine. Rome has this pure water flowing around, you know. 
Try that in Beijing and mm, oh, mm, oh. <laughs> Only once. I'll try that once. Sick for a week. Uh, I will tell you all about that. Anyway, so water. And after you drink water for a while, you go, hey, you know what this does? This quenches my thirst. Hey, water's cool. You know. But it's that lack of flavor that pretty soon instead of this, you're going, and it's good enough. Now, I'm a tea drinker and I coffee drinker. And water does this wonderful thing. You know. So after we kind of come down like this, then we sit and pretty quickly, don't you fall very quiet. And what happens? Your heartbeat slows down at a certain point and it goes still. Your heart stops beating. Whoa. First dhyana. Second dhyana. Your lungs stop breathing. Really quiet. You've now, look at what you've done. You've taken charge of your autonomic system, which is kept where? Fourth skanda. The samskara skanda, the xing yun, is, what, is where the instructions of the body for respiration, for sleep cycles, that's where it's kept, right? Now your stillness is starting to integrate with your own, what's the word? Your metabolism. Your metabolism is starting to yield to your samadhi, to your stillness. How about that? Isn't that interesting? Third, coarse thoughts stop. Fourth, subtle thoughts stop. For him, voices and the mind's thoughts all fall still. This bodhisattva in the ninth stage is now come into control of his or her own metabolism in that fourth skanda. And at that point, it's okay. It's not forced. It's not an idea. It's physically you have been holding precepts so long that you're not outflowing. And there's a, I guess you could say there's a governor somewhere. There's a program in your body that makes this all just right. So it's no mistake. You're not getting there too soon. You couldn't do it if you, if you weren't quiet. So now this is way beyond my pay scale. I, this is not my own experience, right? But I understand the principle of what's going on, how it could be that your mind's thoughts fall still. Pretty far out. Fourth dhyana, probably, maybe, something like that. Okay, so far so good. Just the way an echo goes out, and it's not the case that 30 degrees doesn't hear the echo. All 360, here's an echo in the valley. Hello, 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 hello. Okay, ready? Now, um, okay, next verse of praise changes the subject. We got royal. Ready? Here we go. Royo zheng sheng xin xia lie. Your turn. We be yen shuo sheng wen heng. Ruo xin ming li yao bi zhi. Zi wei bi shuo zhong sheng dao. Okay, over to the right, poor living beings, ready? For living beings whose minds are lowly and base, he explains the practices of a sound hearer. If their minds are sharp and clear and they admire Pracheka Buddhas, he tells them of the way of the middle vehicle. All right. We would probably call that voice hearer now. It's not a sound hearer. So these are different levels of sagehood. Birth and death has ended for an arhat in the, uh, the, the sound hearer, voice hearer, four stages. But the sutra calls them bass and vile. That's pretty, pretty hard on the sound hearers, voice hearers. Um, compared to the bodhisattva's altruistic selflessness, 
<clears throat> an arhat or somebody who wants to cultivate just to get out seems selfish. And that's where that comes from. Pracheka Buddhas are people who cultivate and more of their nature are uncovered in the process. And they hear about the middle vehicle, Chung Dao. Turn the page, please, 56, 57. This verse is related to the one we just read. Ready? Up at the top, y'all there? Page 56, up at the top. Here we go. Ready? Ruo yo tsubei yao rao yi. Your turn. Wei shuo pu sa so xing shi. Ruo yo zui sheng zhi hui xin. Wow, you guys, your Mandarin's really coming on. This is great. Okay, over to page 57. If they, here we go. If they have kindness and compassion and like to benefit others, he tells them of the deeds performed by bodhisattvas. If their minds aspire to the utmost supreme wisdom, he reveals the unsurpassed dharma of the Tathagatas. Okay, we heard about voice hearers, Pracheka Buddhas. Two more. Two more stops on the path of sagehood. These are called the four sages' rebirths, I guess you call them. So we heard about the six-fold, six-spoked wheel, starting at the bottom, hell beings ghosts, animals, called the three unhappy destinies, asuras, humans, and gods, the three wholesome destinies. All six of those make this merry-go-round of places where we are born and die and born and die and come back. Six paths. But in what's called the ten dharma realms, right, there are four more. We're not done. And we just heard their names. Voice hearers, Pracheka Buddhas, also called solitary Buddhas, Bodhisattvas, and Buddhas. So Master Hua calls those the ten Dharma realms, and that's the cosmos. That's all the places we can appear. Okay, and our ten-year-old Dharma protector has puppets of just about every rebirth back there. Currently reborn as a toad, a tree frog. Boy, oh boy. So... A rat, there's a back rat, and a doggy. Yeah, all kinds of rebirths back there. Mostly in the animal realm, but that may be a bodhisattva manifesting as a pack rat. You never know. To cross over a ten-year-old. Mm. So these four sages' rebirths, they're, you can't really call them rebirths because you're not born there. You cultivate to get there. You get there because of vows. And if they have kindness and compassion and like to benefit other beings, what does our Dharma speaker do? He says, oh, there are these bodhisattvas. They are incredible friends. Oh, if you have a bodhisattva for a friend, you're never unhappy for a minute. Or if you're unhappy, they tie it to a principle and you wake up. You see where it came from and you're, you don't, it can hurt but it's not painful. It's painful, but it's not, it doesn't hurt. That, does that make sense? So things happen, but they're not, you're not afraid of it because you understand where it came from and how it ends. That's what a bodhisattva as a friend tells you. Now, there's choice number 10. If their minds aspire to the utmost supreme wisdom, the bodhisattva says, ah, you're heading to Buddhahood. That's what you want. You want to get to the place where all ignorance ends. Your nature completely comes to light. Okay, so this chapter is about speaking Dharma. Ben, is that, is that a question? Oh, you agree? Good, good, good. Okay, we have another verse that is very cool. You ready? It's the second one on page 56. Here we go. P. 
譬如患失做重事。Your turn. 譬如患失做重事。种种形象皆非实。菩萨智幻亦如是，随现一切理有无。Okay, catch this one. This is very, very neat. Here we go. Ready? Just as. Here we go. Just as a magician conjures up all sorts of things of different shapes and features. Yet none of it is real. The Bodhisattva's wisdom magic, in this same way, brings everything into being, free from both existence and non-existence. How's that again? What a neat verse this is, boy. Okay, so we got. This is a little bit of a clue about the Bodhisattva as a shaman. Right, you know that word, shaman, shaman, s h a m a n, kind of a magic man. In Mexico, they're known as brujo, right? A brujo is a shaman, a magician, and a little bit on the dark side, a little edgy, but they're also wholesome and kind brujo. So, this bodhisattva, look what he says: just the way a magician conjures up stuff. Different shapes and features, and yet none of it's real, and you know none of it's real, and you still want to see it anyway, right? The Bodhisattva's wisdom magic is the same way. Wisdom magic. Look at this. Pusa Zhi Huan. I like that. It's the same way. The Bodhisattva's wisdom magic is the same, which is what. Sui Xian Yi Che Li Yu Wu. Everything can appear, but you know, it doesn't exist, and it also doesn't not exist. And there you go. Oh, that's deep. <laughs> What? It's somewhere in a realm where it's now you see it, now you don't. It's real and it's not real, and it's only there to teach us to help us wake up. When that job is done, it goes back to nothing. Okay, so we kind of—I mean, David Blaine is a magician, right? Who's the other guy? Who's David? Who is the guy who was who? David Copperfield is another one. Yeah, who's the guy who puts himself inside a tank of water in Times Square and chains himself? Is that? That's David Blaine. Okay, so he's a contemporary, pretty amazing magician.、Uh, in the past, it was Houdini, Harry Houdini. He's my parents' generation. He was able to escape from stuff. They chain him and put him in a coffin and drop it in New York Harbor, and he would get out of the coffin, of the chains, of the water, pop back up. Oh, how would he do it? You know. I don't think anybody really explained Houdini's tricks, right? So we think about these and we go, "Yeah, magicians. How do they do it? Anybody ever have like play magic tricks as a kid? Did you like write in, mail in for the the kit? And there's card tricks, and you can make a coin appear and disappear. And yeah, I, oh, I haven't thought of this for a long time. My brother Steve and I,、uh, my older brother Stephen, had we were on television. Mostly my brother, he was twelve and I think I was nine, and the show was called The Magic Mascot. Hi, I'm Lucky, the Magic Mascot. Every week I bring you entertaining tricks and stories for young boys and girls. And my brother learned magic tricks, and so did I.、Uh, he was on for about. What eight weeks, and I was on twice, I think. But there was there was one I remember, where、uh, we had a candle, and the candle had a wick, which was a walnut, and the candle was made of an apple core. My mother was very clever. 
she took an apple corer and cored down into a big apple so it looked like a candle and she put a walnut piece wick which burned because they got oil. She, she, and I lit it and then pulled the wick off oh, and ate the candle <laughs> while the camera was rolling. And I was like, oh, that must be magic. <laughs> Either that or it's called a stomach ache. <laughs> But, and, and my brother had some very cool tricks, you know, cards and things that disappeared. And so, yeah, I forgot about that. I think it was W-T-O-L, Toledo. And uh, so we were magicians on TV briefly. So I was nine years old. And here, why are we looking at magicians? The magic mascot, it was called. Lucky the magic mascot. Um, why are we looking at this? It's because the sutra often, frequently, brings up a huan shi, a, an illusion teacher, literally, illusion master. In other words, magician. And what does it tell us? It says the bodhisattva teaches us like a magician. Which is what? The magician makes stuff appear. And you're not quite sure how. And somebody says, oh, it's just a trick. You know. And then, they, well, magicians never reveal their tricks. They never tell you how it's done. And you pay your money so you can be tricked and fooled. And we love it. We love to see what the magician can do. You know. Sawing the girl in half, you know. And uh, shooting arrows into a box and putting a rabbit out of a hat, you know, and, and pulling out claws, one, handkerchiefs, one after the other. Uh, they st stuff, okay, you go like this, right? And then you do this, and you take a handkerchief, and you poke it in, and then you go, five, six, seven handkerchiefs. And everybody's like, you know, things like that, a slate of hand. And it's fun. People, every culture has magic. And sometimes it's like edgy. It's not just, how's that again? You know, pick a card, any card. What, don't tell me the number. You know, that kind of thing. And the Bodhisattva does that with his body, her body, so that you believe them and they teach you how to, you know, how to go from evil to good. So what I like about this idea is that the Bodhisattva brings everything into being free from existence and non-existence. Li yo. Does it exist? Yep. Is it an illusion? Yep. That means it's not real? Yep. Do you believe it? Sure do. You know. So what is it about the magic? Does the magician understand that it's an illusion and how it works? Probably, yeah. So what, is, what does a magician do? Often it's time. Something speeds up or something slows down in their ability to fool us. We're stuck in linear time. The magician does something either so fast or so slow. And here's the point I want to make. We are pretty bound up and attached in our understanding of reality. For example, let's say we slow down time. Suppose, say, 90 years passed in nine minutes. How many breaths would you take in nine minutes? If your 90 years of lifespan were suddenly compressed down to nine minutes, you'd realize human life is fleeting. And where do we come from? Mom and dad. Where do we go? 
we hope, to the Pure Land. How long were we here? Just that long. So when you compress a human lifespan, it's an eye blink. It's over. Take that nine minutes and take it down to nine seconds. If we could change the time, temporal changes. We, we're illusory. We come and we go. When somebody dies, okay, so... Omitofo. Tyndall Air Force Base. Everybody paying attention to Hurricane Michael? Maybe somebody's listening in Florida tonight. Hurricane Michael hit Panama City, Florida. Right there in the panhandle of Florida. Florida's like this. Let's see if I can get it right. Like that. And this is, this is Miami down here, and here's Fort Lauderdale and Okaloosa and all. Well, there's the panhandle. This, this part of Florida, this, this next to Georgia. And the hurricane, Hurricane Michael, went this way, hit the east, the, the west side of Florida, and boom, like that. Entire towns were scraped away, including Tyndall Air Force Base, a fully functioning, fully staffed 6,000 pilots and support family Air Force Base was catastrophically damaged, they say. Including, I read this, and I, then I couldn't believe it, and I read it, and I couldn't believe it, and I read it, and I read it three times before I understood what I was seeing. Tyndall Air Force Base was home to 55 F-22 Raptor fighter jets. The Raptor F-22, it's one of our newest fighter planes in the U.S. Air Force notoriously fragile and tricky they're not they're, they have flaws right they weren't real stable so hurricane is coming smack on to panama city and tyndall air force base what do you do fly the planes out of there right well 33 of them got into the air why 22 of them were under repairs or were not operational. 33 of them flew to Wright-Patterson Air Force Base in Dayton, Ohio. 22 of them were left on the ground. Hurricane Michael came, flipped them over, dropped the hangars on top of them, f picked them up and threw them into grocery stores like toys. 22 airplanes gone in a matter of hours how much does a F-22 Raptor fighter plane cost? Alan? A couple million, right? Connie, you know the answer, don't say. Anybody know? Connie, how much? One plane costs 339 with an M, million dollars. Close to half a billion. One plane. The New York Times called it dizzyingly expensive. 22 of them probably won't even be sold for scrap because they might get the secrets of the, the technology. Just thrown away. Now you see it, now you don't, said the illuser and the illusionist. Right? Okay, so... 340, let's roughly round it out, times 2 is 680, then you add a zero on the end. And you got $6,840,000,000. The storm came along and kind of stomped on them. Imagine if you took one fighter plane's worth of money and gave it to schools, you could have 340. 39 schools, each of whom got a million dollars. And that plane didn't go into the air to destroy life and drop bombs and, you know. But my point is what? Just to say, friends and neighbors, that's where your tax dollars go. 
to our Defense Department. Number two, it's an illusion, isn't it? Here's our pride of our Air Force turned into rubble by the wind. Oh my, the photos, if you look at the New York Times, they took a bunch of aerial photos and put them one by one by one by one. There's a mile, 1.5 miles of rubble where two days ago, the sun, sky was blue before the hurricane came. And people's lives are going on just fine. Now, this unrecognizable trash where the hurricane went through, that's illusory life. How secure is reality? It ain't, right? So maybe the hurricane is our good advisor. That's our friend who comes along to say, hey, guess what? Don't attach to anything because we're all in flux. It is impermanent, transient, passing through, doesn't last long, over in an eye blink. Don't think it's real or permanent because it'll fool you. Right? Maybe the hurricane is the illusionist, the magician. Oh, you thought that was real? I'm going to take it away from you. Boom, it's gone. You know? Oh, my goodness. I mean, I'm making fun of it, but it's shocking. If that was your home, your business, there was this horrible story in the New York Times about this guy who was a Marine who was a chef, and he put his entire restaurant in a boat. And it's called Just One Cook, was the name of the boat, the restaurant. <laughs> Because he was a one-man operation. People loved it. You know, he was a really popular restaurant. And he and all, the hurricane's coming, and ordinarily you just take it under the bridge into the harbor there. The boat dismantled by the storm. And every, he says, I don't know what we're going to do. Everything we had was on that boat. Gone, you know. That's a little microcosm story of thousands of people's lives who, because of the weather, climate change, which doesn't exist according to the White House, I guess it's just an illusion. So, oh my Lord, you know. So, okay, there we go. What gets me about this is the creativity of the Bodhisattva at the ninth stage. What does he make? He makes an entire world, or she, that you believe long enough to change and make the Bodhi resolve. He'll be satisfied, he'll stop at that point. Delusion's over, show's over, you're now out of harm. You've now been pulled out of birth and death, you're safe. The magician's work is over. Right? So that's pretty, I mean, you have to stretch your imagination to see how that could be. What do we see that's closer? Well, I was thinking, um, what's real magic? Uh, theater. I was always drawn to the theater because on stage, you could make people believe that somebody was there doing real life and it was just you putting on an accent, affecting a walk, getting into the mind of the character you're playing, right? In small, that's this afternoon, I had a chance to enter into Howard Swanson briefly, right? The vegetarian cowboy who was the foreman of the Hearst Ranch, right? We were doing storytelling today here, storytelling class. Many of the folks here were present. Brian Conroy's class. Howard Swanson is, uh, he's got a kind of a, Western, it's not really a southern accent. Southern accent to be like this, kind of a little bit slower. He's, he's like, Howard is, uh, hell yes, I eat meat. Every, what, what are you talking about? What else is there to eat? I'm a cowboy. Of course I eat meat. Hey, you know. And uh, Howard was a Buddhist. He joined the Buddhist Association of Sri Lanka. And he's a real guy. We really met Howard Swanson. So, to be able to enter into him briefly for the sake of the story, his magic, 
you know, and you can create a world if you're, if you believe it. You can communicate that to others. So theater is one. Music is another. Music moves us. Music touches us in a place where thought doesn't travel. I don't know why I'm crying, but I'm just crying. Something about that piano, you know. Oh, that's my favorite song. Remember when we were so joyful and lighthearted and young? You know, everybody has their songs. Magic, here we go. You've seen the video of the old gentleman in the senior's home, right? Who has not communicated with the staff or his family, his daughter, for years because of Alzheimer's, dementia, right? And he's just, all day long he's like that, just uncommunicative. There's a new therapy. The, the uh, therapist comes in, puts a pair of $5 headphones on old grandpa and plays him Cab Calloway. Big dance band music. Remember Cab Calloway, David? Right? He's, Cab Calloway was uh, African-American band leader. Wonderful. He could do scat singing. Boodle-ya-ba-da-ba, ba ba do like that. And the old gentleman's eyes open up and he goes, Yeah, yeah, Cab Calloway. And he's singing. The music cuts right past the part of the brain that's not functioning and goes to a place where memories are held. And it's magic, according to the nurses who've been trying to get some response from him for years, Put some music from his childhood. Oh, from his, not from his, his, his youth, right? And he's out there singing to his sweetie the way he was when he was 20. And it brought back life to his brain. Magic? No, we just don't understand the mind. We don't go there. Funny. We will send astronauts into space unless the booster rocket fails, which happened. Uh, hey there, safety officer. You should thank your lucky stars you don't have to insure rocket boosters. That would be a headache. All you have is a Buddha city to take care of. So. so, yeah, but we don't know what's going on with our own brains in our parents. We don't know in ourselves, right? So, what else creates universes? Uh, let's see here. Why do we love movies? Same. Boy, oh boy, you go into a theater. Theater experiences are different than your computer or your tablet, right? You go into that wide silver screen with the surround sound and you go, pour it in, I'm ready. Fill me up because I want to be carried out of myself, right? Oh boy, we had a... a we had our monk from Taiwan, Master Ming Guang, was with us at City of 10,000 Buddhas on Monday. And uh, he told us about how he, uh, he grew up in a marketplace in Taiwan, in a place called Shulin. And his parents were vendors there, fruit sellers. He says, I pretty much grew up all around there and, you know, a great place to grow up innocent childhood with a supportive community. Marty Verhoeven, the same in Appleton, Wisconsin. So he said that marketplace, bit by bit, kind of dried up. Everybody went to the mall instead. In the marketplace where you could see the faces of the other vendors, you know, kind of just nobody did it anymore. The younger generation stayed away. So he, as a, as a monk, uh, vowed to bring it back. So he's had three years of music festivals in the old market at, in Shulin. And at night, they show old Taiwanese black and white movies. I can't even say it. It's, it's Taiwanese. 
Liang Shan Bo Yu Zhu Ying Tai. Okay, how many people have seen it? You're all too young. Okay, at a certain generation, everybody's seen it. Jin Foster says he knows people who have seen it 30 times? 38 times. You yourself have seen it. <laughs> Alan, you've seen it. Once, yeah. He said it was the rage in Taiwan. It was hong. It was hot in Taiwan for a long time. All of South Asia. It was called uh, the Chinese Romeo and Juliet, right? The what? Huan Mei Diao. Oh, Huang Mei Diao. Yellow Plum. Yeah, and so Ming Guang says we, we showed that one and everybody loved it. Why? It, we enter into a world that brings everything into being free from both existence and non existence. Okay, look at, this is the point. This is really, really, really interesting because. It's something that we don't recognize, but is absolutely true, which is what we like to believe illusions. Right? In our dining room, right down the hall here, we have a mobile flat panel display, courtesy of kind-hearted Dharma protectors, whose company disbanded and sold off a whole bunch of flat panel displays. And this kind-hearted Dharma protector said, oh, the monastery could use one. So it's a big, nice screen, you know, it's flat, it's about this thick. And you can be watching from the front and, oh, something wonderful is going on. You know, Romeo and Juliet, they both die. Oh, we cry, we cry, you know, so tragic. And all you have to do is walk three steps to the edge of the flat panel and look over here. Where'd the story go? Oh, oh, I'm so sad. And then you go, where'd the story go? It's all happening on this side and our emotions are stirred up and we're like totally into it. How could she? Oh, somebody tell him. He's not dead. Don't. Oh, it's too late. Oh. And, and you go, nothing happened on this side of the screen. What's that about? On this side, it's totally engaging and kept, you know, it's a world here and it moves us. It's that thick. Over here, nothing. How strange. Why do we love to be tricked? We do. Phil. Currently it's crazy rich Asians. Crazy rich Asians. That's a trick. That's an illusion, right? Right? No, actually that's true in Singapore. So, how funny we're all totally willing to get involved on this side of the screen. And knowing full well that if you do that, it's all over, but it's okay to do that somehow. The Bodhisattva knows that. And uses that to teach us. Isn't that interesting? We think, what is this stuff with Hua Shan, transformed body Bodhisattvas? Every single movie we've ever seen is that thick. However thick the screen is, it's just pixels dancing on a screen. Couldn't be more ephemeral, but we go, oh, she's so pretty. Oh, he's so handsome. Oh, don't do it. Oh, you know. <laughs> boy meets girl, boy loses girl, boy finds girl again. You know, that's the plot <laughs> every time. And we, you know, and none of it's true. But we will go back and see it 38 times. <laughs> I'll be, you know, I'll be deluded 38 times. I'll be tricked 38 times. Isn't that interesting? I just realized that. That the sutras, the bodhisattva knows that we have that big door that we will let in the story because we want to believe it. We, we are eternally hopeful. Right? And the bodhisattva uses that to teach us. How interesting. The illusionist. Yeah. This is real psychology. Who says the Avatamsaka Sutra's philosophy irrelevant to lives? Can't understand it. Don't explain it. Fall into the hells, you get it wrong. Don't believe them. 
So, he brings everything into being, free from both existence and non-existence. Is the movie real? Well, the movie's real. Is the story real? Well, in my mind it is. You know. No, it doesn't exist and it's really true. How interesting. Right there is where there's a big door there that we don't even see it. And the Bodhisattva you goes right in there and starts to teach us. Is he real? Yeah. Is he totally an illusion? Yeah. Very cool. Just the way we suspend reality to watch a movie, we suspend our doubts to believe the Bodhisattva. How interesting. Okay. Uh, 57, number 3. Let's read number 3 together, starting with Ru Shi. Here we go. Ru Shi Mei Yin Qian Wan Zhong. Your turn. Okay, together as these, ready? As these millions of beautiful sounds finish their praises of the Buddha, they suddenly fell still. Moon of Liberation said, Now this multitude has been purified. Please describe the way practiced upon the ninth stage. Okay, they're ready. They have been purified. You can tell your story now. Vajra Treasury, Bodhisattva. Very neat. Okay, do you have a songbook? Everybody have one? Did they come out? The songbooks come out? Oh, if not, Connie, don't worry about it. We, we don't, that's all right. That's all right. That's all right. <coughs> Thank you for that. Um, <coughs> I'll just sing it for you. This song, nobody ever understood it. We never sang it often. But if you think about it in terms of this, people do wake up and they make a decision and they never turn back to confusion after waking up. There's a, uh, this is a, it's, it's, there's a reason for this song that uh, I think was underappreciated, if you ask me. It's called Another Man Done Gone. And it's a song about prison farms. And African Americans who were first enslaved, and then when they would escape, they would be put in a prison farm to labor, working on a chain gang. They would occasionally try to escape. Mostly they'd be shot dead or chewed by dogs or whipped to death or lynched. And occasionally they'd get free. And the song goes, another man done gone, another man done gone, another man done gone from the county farm, another man done gone. So it's a song about somebody who escaped, who made it up to the, the uh, Underground Railroad. So I thought, oh, how appropriate for somebody who's gone from birth and death who's escaped from samsara. That's the idea. So another man, another one, because it could be a woman, another one done gone, another one done gone, another one done gone, gone far beyond. Another one done gone. Gate, gate, paragate. Gone, gone, far beyond. Gone, gone far, far beyond, right? I saw a woman so intent to get free, she cut off her hair and sat under a tree. Who would do that? Right? 
I saw a man so on fire for the way, he sat silent in a room day after day. Another one done gone, right? This is like, huh. I saw a man so determined to go home, he walked up a mountain and sat like a stone. Another man done gone, right? Imagine, putishin, huh? Bodhisattvas, moved by our pain, come into this world to teach us again. Another man done gone. Doesn't exactly rhyme, but, mm, right? And then it goes. Gate, gate, parasam, gate, parasam, gate, bodhi, spaha. Like that. You'll know it when we get there. Okay. Another one done gone. Another one done gone. Another one done gone. Gone far beyond another one done gone. I saw a woman so intent to get free. She cut off her hair and sat under a tree. Another one done gone. Another one done gone. On. The boys didn't go there. Another one done gone. Gone far beyond. Another one done gone. I saw a woman so weary of desire. She took the Buddha's precepts and put out the fire. Another one gone gone. Another one done gone. Another one done gone. Gone far beyond. Another one done gone. I saw a man so on fire for the way He sat silent in a room day after day Another one done gone Another one done gone Another one done gone Gone far beyond Another one done gone I saw a man so determined to go home. He walked up the mountain and sat like a stone. Another one done gone. Another one done gone. Another one done gone. Gone far beyond. Another one done. Okay, here's the last verse. Bodhisattvas, moved by our pain, come into the world to teach us again. Another one done gone. Another one done gone. Another one done gone. Gone far beyond. Another one done gone. Okay, you ready for the Heart Sutra mantra? Here we go. Gate, gate. Gate, gate. Para, gate. Parasam, gate. Bodhisvaha, gate. Gate, para, gate. Parasam, gate. Bodhisvaha, gate. Gate, para, gate. Parasam gate bodhisvaha gate gate para gate parasam gate bodhisvaha. That's called another one done gone. Mm. Okay, story time. We got a lot of stuff here. Story time. One of our best stories has to do with Philip Lai. Who knew? 
<laughs> what, 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 what? Okay. We have been looking for four bags that came in on Saturday. Two were an offering from Hangzhou, one was an offering from Shanghai, and a third was an offering from Taipei. Lots of political significance around these offerings, right? And after they were offered, they were put in a corner, then they were put in different hands, and people said, eh, and they vanished. And going, hey, those bags. Oh no, the offerings. What were they? I have no idea where they go. Oh, let's see. Oh man, who had them last? I called Sam and I called Jin Wei up at Wabachang. I called Jin Pui and I called Jin Pui. No, I haven't seen them. No, no, I haven't seen them. Oh, we got a photo of them. Oh, we took a picture of them. We circled it. We circulated the picture around. Madalena made a dozen phone calls, you know. Who was the driver? Oh, there was that tall one, then there was the short one, and then I don't know who they are. One was named Ashia. I mean, calling it. it wasn't Agong. We knew that. It wasn't Agong. And, and it was like, oh, but they went to the hotel. Oh, they must have lost them in the hotel. Oh, my God. Oh, no. Who knows? Let's call Wampa Chung. Wampa Chung, call the girls' school. Oh, no. We don't know where they are. We're thinking, Maybe they'll show up someday. I announced it today at lunch. We had everybody. We said, we'll have lots of hands and eyes out there. <laughs> so this evening, Philip Lai comes in. Hi, by the way, I think somebody left this thing. <laughs> and he goes, oh, oh, oh. Phil, what? what? What's wrong? I just, oh. <laughs> we had an all points of search out for them, Phil. And you ha they were peacefully in your car, safe and sound. You took care of them. And when the time came, you brought him back. Omi <laughs> Tofu. <sighs> yeah, you were sweating there. Oh, man, you were sweating. We were sweating. Oh, God. We didn't know what they were. They'd just been offered up, you know. There, it's, there, it's, there was a box of chocolates. There was two scrolls. There were some stuff. Just nice offerings. Yeah, yeah. And you took, you took, I know, I know, and you say, we should have called you first. That would have saved us a week of, as the, my Jewish friends say, tsuris. Oh, we were up deep to, in tsuris. So anyway, okay. Omi tofu. I didn't lose Shrufu's offerings. Ha. <laughs> okay, we were looking for stories. Brian Conroy uh, teaches a great storytelling class. And uh, so I have in my, let's see. Oh, uh, yes, there, Chen Yu. Um, and uh, also a story about offering that are, it's an email I received from one of my, our Dharma friends from the Sixth Patriarch. Uh, mailing group. So basically, uh, he's a Dharma friend who also made you offering uh, on Saturday, Yan Ming. Yan Ming from Singapore. Yes. Yeah, so um, he sent me an email. Actually, I'm supposed to uh, forward the email to you. Um, he wants to express his gratitude that once he made the offering, he said, you bow to the Buddhas or Bodhisattvas. He said he feel really touched. That's the first time he saw a Dharma master receive an offering and bow to the, I mean, ah. half bow to the Buddha and Bodhisattva. So nice. that's something he want, to, want me to pass on to thank you. Thank you, thank you for that. Okay, yeah, that's, this is someone who joins our, our Friday afternoon sutra group, facilitated by many of the people in the room here, but never seen him, you know, and then he popped up on that Saturday, there he was. Yeah, great. So he, his, he was just glad that that was, that was it. He just wanted you to tell me that, right? Okay, How oh, good. Yeah, that's nice. That group is really a whole, we got almost to 40 today. Did you see? Yesterday. We almost had 40 people. We had 38 at one point. Okay. Um, I got instructions from Master Hua from Shurfu to keep journals and stories. 
because he said, you'll use these the rest of your life speaking Dharma. This will be your... Uh, your... Um, what do you call it? Your... your Bunjin, right? This is your stash from which you will tell stories in the future. What's the word I'm looking for? The banking word? The bunjin. Your, not your investment. Your, your what? Assets. Yeah, there's another word. Your, your, the, the foundation money that you have. Principle. This is the principle from which, yeah, there's another word too. It's your what? Your account. Nah. Anyway, this is, this is the, your resources from which you'll tell stories. So, and I've held these notebooks. They're from 1979. And one of them, stories, we'll, we'll publish them someday, I hope, before I die. Mm. Long time we've had them. So, Bowing outside Santa Cruz, University of California, Santa Cruz. Some of you are very, very, very familiar with that campus, having spent years there. And down from the campus came a journalist. She reported to us that she was actually from the school paper, but we looked at it and didn't think so. She was a Marxist. Right? She was a Marxist, and she had as her colleague somebody who was more radical than she was, egging her on. She, the woman was the, the journalist was a woman. She had a, a guy with her who was obviously interested in her romantically, but couldn't admit it, and so was just sublimating all this desire into meanness, being mean, you know. And they saw two Buddhist monks bowing and decided that we were beneath contempt. We represented everything that was wrong with the opiate of the masses, religion, right? So they came out to level us and to put us in our place, not knowing that Marty Verhoeven, Hung Chao, had been part of the SDS, Students for a Democratic Society, on the campus, Madison, University of Wisconsin, where it's the only place during the weather underground, this, I think this is all before all of your times, except a few of us who maybe are, knows the story here. Uh, the SDS and the, the weather men, there was only one episode of domestic, what we call now domestic terrorism, where the computer center was bombed, happened in Madison, Wisconsin, and a graduate student was killed. And that was when the, I think the FBI, who had been infiltrating the weathermen and the SDS, really came on. Marty was in that core group. He cut his teeth on radical politics in the 60s. He's not a pushover. And this, this person came out, it was pretty clear that for her, radical politics was kind of the flavor of the week. You know, you put on the clothes and you walk the walk. And Anyway, so she came out to set us straight. And uh, she's, they were sneering at the monks, disdainful of religious faith in general. She started out her interview by saying, in my view, Buddhism is elitist, exclusive, parasitical, and frivolous. What is the class and racial background of the Saba, Sino-American Buddhist Association? We were now DRBA. It was SABA then. Marty said, we don't think in terms of those divisive categories. She says, how can you avoid the reality of those divisive categories? Meaning, she's got our number, right? Marty said, well, everything's made from the mind. If that's the way you want to divide up the world, that's the quality of your reality. Oh, she didn't like that. How can you be comfortable taking the time to make a pilgrimage like this? 
third world people couldn't afford it. They have more primary concerns like filling their bellies. Your three steps, one bow journey is possible only where people eat their fill. Only if somebody is earning wages can you then sit around in transcendent bliss. She said, figuring that was her big gun. I mean, that was pretty much her, you know, her bomb. And so Marty, cool as a cucumber. And I was, you know, I wasn't talking, but I was, you know, <laughs> writing all this down. Marty says, nobody who understands people could say that. Third world people are human beings. They have other concerns than simply filling their bellies. Buddhism is the language of the heart. It gathers in all beings, not just humans, rich and poor alike. She says, well, how, how are you adding to the world's production living in a safe monastery like a soft parasite? Right? Marty says, uh, we eat once a day when food is given to us. Otherwise, we forage for the food that we eat every meal. It's free on the ground. My colleague here doesn't talk. We never solicit. We ask for nothing. We eat low on the food scale. We're strict vegetarians. Looking up and down at this person who obviously is a meteor. We don't use heat. We uh, live in this car. Back then, homelessness didn't exist. Right? We don't wear new clothes. We wear the same robes. You're looking at our wardrobe. We never use money for food. Our motto is, freezing to death, we do not beg. Starving to death, we ask for nothing. Dying of poverty, we never scheme. We accord with conditions, but do not change. Unchanging, we follow conditions. How about you? He said. And at this point, her boyfriend was disgusted. He just turned around and walked away, leaving her there. And she turned around to get his support, and he was gone. And she's like, <laughs> you know. Now she has to stand on her own convictions. Hung Chao says, I was a member of the Students for a Democratic Society at the University of Washington. We gave birth to the Weather Underground. I was learning radical politics before you were born, he said. I left behind empty slogans and heartless dialectics when I picked up the great compassion and wisdom of the Buddha. That's why I'm appearing this way before you. And the woman just closed her notebook and got in her sports car and drove away. <laughs> so it's like afterwards, you know, I wrote, I said, Marty, that was pretty impressive. I, don't, I couldn't have done that. And he said, uh, yeah, materialism is a two-sided coin. Haves and have-nots are both confused. One by greed and the other by distress, by lack. He said, if you have angry externalization of a mixture of guilt and greed, he said, you're never going to get to the point. People are more than hungry bellies and mouths. And that was Marx's blindness to that. Just the dialectical materialism is very cold and people are not exclusively mouths. Great compassion, he said, will never be overcome by great division. The purely political view has no heart. This woman came out with an arrogant and superior attitude that assumes that poor people are always worse off than she is, feeling slightly guilty about her own material possessions. Marxists believe that economics is the ultimate measure of a human being. Is it the case that somebody with two televisions and a sports car is better off? 
has this person ever actually sacrificed personal comfort for a principle or a cause? He said, the Buddhist Sangha are the original communists. That is to say, we own nothing and share everything equally. Whatever comes, that's what we use. Right? Um, he said, is this person using radical politics as a fashion, as an opportunity to express anger over some personal issue, and we were the expedient outlet? <laughs> he said, that was what I was seeing. When we went to rural Malaysia, said Marty, he said, we understood poverty and its many dimensions. There, the old people that we met sit at home alone in their houses on stilts above the kampong there with the TV antenna coming out of their thatched roof because their children seeking wealth and excitement in Kuala Lumpur and in Penang have left the village, leaving the elders poor and rich. When the kids move to the cities in pursuit of wealth, progress means affliction. The parents don't consider themselves poor in any way except in the loss of their children. They fear that when the children go into the cities and forget their, where they've come from, heritage and tradition will be lost. That's true poverty. Although these elders live, I mean, they have a TV, but they want for nothing. They're rich in relationships, rich in tradition, and in security and identity. And the children rip that away in search of lights and excitement in the big city. That's true poverty. So if you can live content with fewness of desires, no matter how much money you have, as long as you're not suffering, you are wealthy in the way. So Marty says finally, in this, this is the story, he says, the Buddha Dharma is what I was looking for all along. Everybody has the Buddha nature. Everybody, without exception, can become wise. Anyone who can hear that message in their heart cannot resist the sound of truth. It's irresistible. So, thinking today about our storytelling, and uh, one of these days we should publish all these stories. So, that's great. That, one, that story is called The Monks and the Marxists. <laughs> All right. Uh, let's hear about events. What's coming up? Well, um, in terms of Berkeley Buddhist Monastery, is there anything special this week? No, so it's just a regular schedule. Um, I think Monday we have class, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, and then the Saturday lecture as usual. Um, starting next week, which is October 20th, the Guanyin session at the 7,000 Buddhas will start, and so that'll go for one week. If you're interested in attending, you might be want to talk with myself or Jing Wei and we can uh, help you get signed up. Um, if you would like to go ahead, go and kind of have some English classes, you should go to drbux.org or extension.drbu.edu um, to sign up there so you can get uh, join the kind of English program. But other than that, I think, okay. I think that's pretty much it for right now. Um, I'm going to make an early exit and ask Jin Weisher to lead us in the transference of merit. See you all next week. We have one more lecture before... Three of us are off to China for 10 days, but we'll be back in the blink of an eye. And Jin Vosher and Jin, Wei and Jin Husher will be carrying on our, our lectures. So everybody should say hello to Jenny Sue before you leave tonight and her mm -hmm. daughter Emily, 
who are visiting from Phoenix, Arizona, and are happily part of our community. Do we, have you all identified her as Jin Forsher's daughter, mm. granddaughter? Grew up in Minnesota and uh, married to Chen Bin and living in Phoenix. And she, because uh, Phoenix is closer than upstate New York and Minnesota, we get to see her, both of them, more often. So, Okay. All right. And thanks again, Phil. Jerry, how many folks? Fifty. Okay, great. Appreciate the work in Australia of translating. Okay. Do you want to come up and lead everybody in the transference? Okay, see you all next week. Yeah, so we have, next week's going to be the last storytelling class, which is going to be on October 20th. Brian Conroy has been leading kind of a series of, of classes teaching basics of storytelling. So today we worked on uh, character voices, using your body, using your voice. Um, and so that was pretty, I think it's a lot of fun for a lot of people. And next week we'll have the last class, October 20th, where we'll all share our stories that we picked um, before about a uh, story on wisdom. But we might start again. Yeah, so and we're thinking, if people are interested in doing more storytelling, please talk to me, and, and we're, we're kind of thinking about what's the next phase of this program. Like, is it going to be more classes? Are we going to have like a regular kind of storytelling time? You know, what, what can we do? Jing Weisher brought up an idea of having a storytelling, Buddhist storytelling festival. I mean, people can uh, present their, their stories. So um, if people have ideas this week, please email me or come talk with me and we can kind of have a list of things to kind of think through and then we can decide on what we could do after this last class next week. But it's really, it's really I find, um, great because a lot of the, the, I would say the younger generation who is kind of, part of the Great Strength Academy, and then they've gone to the world. And, you know, I can see growing up here in the monastery, sometimes, you know, the religious stuff is kind of a little bit too religious. And so it's like right in between. It's kind of fun. It's engaged in the world and um, actually very useful because we always are telling stories to our, our friends and family, children, parents, ourselves. So, okay. Just from here. I can't play the banjo, so we're just singing. <laughs> yeah, use your imagination. The illusion, yeah, the illusion. So the, the transference of merit is on the sheet in front of you, the dedication of merit. And it's a time you can sh reflect on anything you wish to spread that goodness to. Parents, family, people suffering from disasters. May every living being Our minds as one and radiant with light Share the fruits of peace With hearts of goodness, luminous and bright If people hear and see how hands and hearts can find in giving unity. May our minds awake to great compassion, wisdom, and to joy. May kindness find reward. May all who sorrow leave their grief and pain. May this boundless light dispel the darkness of their endless night. 
Because our hearts are one, this world of pain turns into paradise. May all become compassionate and wise. May all become compassionate and wise. Or please stand. 